how does one go about constructing a successful math program? Larry Mitchell's fifth grade class at Badger Road Elementary in North Pole, Alaska may provide some guidance. His students are supported by a potent mixture of ubiquitous, engaging technology tools and flexible student-centered instruction based on curriculum standards and individual needs. The result is a classroom in which all the students are being challenged and, fi and are finding success. They seem to enjoy, as one student put it, the freedom to learn. Larry draws on four main sources of math practice and instruction, all implemented on the iPads in his classroom. Everyday Mathematics is a district-specified math curriculum. MobyMath is an online diagnostic and prescriptive tool that students use independently to push themselves to their individual limits. IXL is a website that provides targeted drill and practice and relevant skills. And Khan Academy is used supplementally by some students who need advanced instruction. But the focus is not on the tools or the technology. It's clearly on the students. In this video, Larry explains his approach to teaching by outlining a typical day, if there is such a thing in his classroom. So, kind of the approach that I've got in here, that's kind of developed with this group of kids, which is of course different than last year and the year before, is with this group of kids, a typical math lesson, we start off discussing a concept. So, for example, yesterday it was scientific notation. And so on the back of the official curriculum page that we do, um, we, we take notes, and we take notes on this concept. And then, and that's kind of a whole group discussion, and some of the kids you can see, they get it, some of them don't. It's not uncommon for somebody to say, oh, I did that in Moby the other day, and you know they're kind of rolling their eyes because that's not really where they're at with things. Um, but some kids are struggling. Well, but some kids are struggling, and the idea is that we're presenting a kind of a common core piece of knowledge here. It's an exposure. Um, of course, where that probably needs to develop from now is to do you know a few more examples of that and give them a chance to, you know, do I know it? Don't I know it? Kind of thing. And then we we flip over on the other side because you know with the curriculum we you know we, we have to do these math boxes. It's part of the that's kind of that paper that we have to show. And so from there. Um, and then we kind of flip over on the other side, which is the, the math boxes that goes with our everyday math program. And, kind and, of the, the worksheets. and that's kind of the worksheet stuff. And just the nature of everyday math, um, the lesson may be on scientific notation, but the math boxes, it's something that was six weeks ago or something you haven't seen for a year sometimes. And so my way of dealing with that more is to look at each problem and kind of give the kids some reminders and you know, what are the keywords here, what are they trying to do, what are some methods that we've shown you how to solve this? And not that that's how you have to do it, but it's more just a kind of spark of, oh, that's right, we've seen this before. And what math function should we do to that three and five? Okay, somebody said multiply. And then let's start working through this problem. So knowing what the acronym is, what's the first thing I need to do in this problem? I think it is like a, a target, a bullseye. We want to start with the stuff as close to the center as possible. So which one can we start with? Either one. Either one. So, and at that point, they're free to finish the worksheets. And then there's always, there's always an IXL drill that complements the general nature of the lesson. And, then and that's something you provide to them. And that's something I provide. I'm actually saying this is the drill that you need to do. And everybody does it. And everybody does it. Well, they're supposed to do it. Um, and some kids, I mean, it's, it's refreshing now because some kids, are, they already did it. They've kind of seen the pattern of how we're working through a section of IXL. And so like right now, a lot of the drills have to do with graphing and creating graphs and stuff. And so there's some kids that just went and they knew we were probably going to do all 15 of those. And so they've actually done all of them. So in a sense, they're they're creating kind of space for themselves to do some of this other stuff. Uh, the Moby Math, we've gotten to a point now where the kids are past the easy stuff that they could learn quickly. And so we're actually getting into some concepts with some of these kids that there's a lot of thinking. They're, it's not a I can do a problem a minute kind of approach. And so we've seen the Moby Math going, you know, right now, if, I guess if you're an average kid, if you want to use those terms, <laughs> You should be at about a level 5.5, and we've got kids from 3.2 to 8.8, .8. and you know that's a huge difference 
and there's no way we can instruct the movie math because every kid's doing something different. So they do it independently. Yeah, so that becomes all independent to them. And so what I need to do, and I mean, we try as best we can, is to give them a, a slot of time during the day that they can work on their movie. And that becomes very individual to them. And usually it's a partner thing. Someone's doing the movie math and somebody else is reading or, or you know, with the fifth grade, you know, they're at orchestra or whatever the case is. But the idea is we've gone from you have to spend so much time in movie math a week to now you have to accomplish so many problems per week. Mm. And So it, in one sense it's remedial because the kids that are at a lower than grade level function are working on oh yeah. remedial stuff. Oh, yeah. But in another sense it's enriching because kids that are way above grade level can oh, yeah. find yeah. challenging stuff. So when, when, when you have work time in school like this and it's not necessarily math, it's not necessarily reading, do you ever find that you don't have anything to do? Yeah. yeah. When, what do you do when that happens? I usually do um, the vocabulary and sometimes we read it. So like you're finished with your math assignment mm -hmm. and then you, you choose something to do? Yeah. And vocabulary is one of them? Mm -hmm. Reading. <laughs> if it's not math time, can you do math? Uh, yeah. If you just go into movie math and just do that too? But it becomes pretty free flowing. The kids are pretty easy about coming up, you know, with an iPad in hand, and I don't get this or I do get this, and you know, we kind of take a few notes and a little bit of direction. And once they have a sense of what they're doing, then you know, off you go with it. Kind so of how thing. much uh, how much time do you spend typically instructing math in the class? And and when you do that, what does it look uh, like? I mean, is that is that basically everyday math? Yeah, it's it's everyday math, and and. The goal is to do a lesson per day because that's kind of the, the structure of the program in terms of the academic year and so many lessons and so many days and all that. Um, boy, typical, uh, they'll come in. Um, they're pretty keen on knowing that they've got to get their paper out because I, I give them a whole unit at a time. And so they've got those in their binders and they basically go to the next page. They know because it's a note-taking experience, not just a math experience. So they're pretty keen on flipping it over and you know getting name and date and header kind of information on there. Um, I don't know. That part might last 10, 15 minutes, maybe. I mean, it depends. Some concepts you need more than that. Um, I tend to show them in those note-taking things, I guess, sometimes some unconventional ways of doing math because sometimes I think we make it so much more difficult than it is. So as you spot something else, you know, we can go back and kind of cover what leads into this kind of stuff. Uh, the math boxes, well, it depends on the page. Some of those, there's maybe five minutes of instruction. And it's, I mean, it's funny, yesterday we did that, and no sooner did I say, okay, go start working on these things, and paper started coming up to us, you know, because I'm done, you know, and which tells you they were not listening mm. to the instruction, which, okay, well, no big deal. Um, but they were successful. But they were successful. I mean, they're turning their stuff in. And, you know, and there's more to just doing the math. I mean, we're also trying to set this pattern with fifth graders going on to a middle school. You know, you got to get your work done. you got to get it turned in. It's got to be readable. Um, and I think they're well past that stage now. And so is there, is there bleed over? I mean, do you notice an effect on how well they perform in, in everyday math based on the other stuff they do? Um, is that reinforcing? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I think so. We just did that mid-year assessment uh, right before the break and got those scores back. And of course, you know, none of the scores surprise you because you start learning your students and kind of where they are within the spectrum. But it was kind of pleasing. I had two kids that, you know, got every problem right. And one of them took, you know, all of seven minutes to go through it. You know, so of course, he's way at this top end. But not surprising in Moby, he's at 8.8 .8 now. I mean, math's his thing. Um, I guess what was reassuring to me and I don't have a basis on a district perspective because they don't give us that information. But I mean, the average score was like an 87 percent or 85 or something like that, which I think you know is pretty, pretty good within that program, just because what they present, you know, it's six months and you know there's 31 problems. So how do we take you know however many lessons that is and pick whatever those representative things are? But I know from past years. Um, we've been very successful in terms of kids transitioning to the middle school and being able to be placed in more advanced classes. Um, 
So, and it's my goal. I, I think it would be absolutely kind of fun in an own weird way to push the envelope that all these kids go up and they test out of sixth grade math and seventh grade math and what are we going to do with them? Mm -hmm. I, I would love to send that message on mm -hmm. because I think we need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge there are kids that are in seventh grade and sixth grade that are really ready for algebra classes. They're mm -hmm. prepared for that. The success of Larry's program depends on having iPads available all day every day, but they're not the sole reason that the program works, nor does one curriculum or service provide the range of challenges that his students need. Ultimately, his student success comes from his student-centered approach to instruction. Using Moby Math, Larry can easily tell exactly where each student is performing and where they're struggling. IXL provides drill and practice to support the regular curriculum, and Khan Academy provides independent help for those with more advanced needs. Students take responsibility for their learning and become more independent as time goes on. But there's more to it than that. Larry has a strong grounding in math, not just the math required of his grade level, but the math that his students need as a foundation in earlier grades and the math that they will encounter as they progress through later grades. Understanding the spectrum is critical to his students' success. This speaks volumes to the need for domain knowledge on the part of the teacher, no matter what grade level is taught. That's one reason that the next video in this series deals with the transition to middle school math. Stay tuned.